About 35 years ago, a Roman Catholic Benedictine theologian who has recently died, the great Father Sebastian Moore, wrote about the will of God. He said in his article that the will of God was a way of talking about what he called God's wanting to be in our lives, the pressure of God wanting to be in our lives. It's a phrase that I found immediately illuminating and which I've never been able to forget. It removes an idea of the will of God as something imposed on creation from outside. It reminds us that the God we speak of, the free God, the God who wills things, is the God whose act and being is the very foundation of our act and being. We are because God is. And in our being, God seeks to be, to live more deeply and more fully. So that's an image I want to start with of the act and being of God, so to speak, pushing up from under the soil of our surface, the soil of our surface life. Constantly, in every moment, every second of our existence, there is an energy rising. There is the act and being of God seeking to be more fully in us. And even in those moments when we feel most dead, most passive, most stupid, perhaps especially in those moments, that pressure is steadily coming up. But it seems to me that what we say at Christmas is that at a pivotal point in the history of the world, that divine pressure, that longing to be in creation broke through. It flowered. We use that imagery, don't we, in Christmas carols. A spotless rose is blowing. We think of the flowering of Mary's yes and Jesus' coming to be in the body of Mary. The soil has been you might say, irrigated for innumerable millennia and drawing up the pressure of God's act and being from within, from the depth. But here in this moment where all the roads of history intersect, this still point of the turning world, as it's been called, here God's pressure to be in the world, God's will, God's self poured out in what we can only think of as a divine desire comes through. Obviously, to speak of God wanting and desiring and longing, this is metaphor. And yet, anyone who's ever sought to be still before God and to be open to God will, I think, have some sense of the water rising, the pressure surging, the growth coming under the soil of the surface. To speak of that as God wanting to be, well, it's a helpful peg on which to hang some sense of the urgency and intensity of that depth so deep it's not recognizable to us, so intimate to us that it's not other to us, so strange to us, that it seems like something quite alien, all at once, all of that coming to be. And the blossom, the flower, is Jesus. So the beginning of the gift of Christmas is, I'd say, in the recognition that in this event, in this life, something is released in the world and thus released in us. That 
upsurge of infinite, nameless, boundless act and energy, which we sometimes call power and sometimes love, coming through, that liberates us. It locates us, it sets us in a new place, where in us too, that may rise and blossom. And when we sit in meditation, what we ask is that that pushing up of life comes alive in us. That the pressure of God wanting to be in us is allowed that bit more space, that bit more reality and maturity. The gift begins there. And all of that, of course, is anchored very deeply in the language of Scripture, especially in the unforgettable language of the beginning of St. John's Gospel. What does that say? In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. In other words, in the beginning, God breathed out, as you might say. God is never without life, breath, reason, order, communication. God is never without sharing. And that divine, eternal, and boundless, and nameless sharing is that in which all things hold together. The fathers of the Eastern Church spoke about how the Logos, the everlasting order and reason and mind of God, translated so thinly as word in our scripture, how that Logos is reflected like a white beam passed through a prism in the variety of Logoi, the different acts of God's mind in each one of us. Creation is the outpouring through that eternal word, Logos, into each one of us. And in each one of us, that is what is alive, most deeply alive in us. And as we respond to the gift of God, what comes alive is what God has already given. That facet, that single aspect, that beam of colored light from the one movement of God in each one of us, kindled, reflected back into the eternal. And again, that's what we pray and hope happens as we sit in silence with God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was nothing made that was made. And the text, of course, goes on to speak of how the light of this divine action enlightens the whole world, and how that light can be refused and suppressed. We can sit very firmly on the Logos and the light. We can pile all kinds of things on top of it. We can stifle it. We can wrap up the newborn Jesus in so tight a suit of swaddling clothes that we can't hear a peep out of him. But the word, the eternal sharing act of God is, says St. John, made flesh. And we see it. And if we have the gift of seeing it fully, joyfully and gratefully, then, says St. John, we are given, and the exact word he uses is, the authority to become the children of God. We have the authority, the right to claim that we are indeed beings resting on the being and act of God, and that as such, we have the authority, the liberty to claim to speak as Jesus spoke to his eternal source. 
we can pray, Abba, Father. So the gift is the release in us of that depth of logos, that depth of divine sharing life. And the gift is that that comes to speech and awareness in us as we learn to see God as Jesus sees God and to be where Jesus is in relation to the eternal God, which is, says St. John once again, in the bosom of the Father, tightly hugged to the Father's breast. That's where we belong, and the gift given us is to be there at home with the eternal, the infinite, from whom we come, by whose life we live. That's where we now are. The gift of Christmas, then, is a gift of liberation. What is deepest in us is uncovered and allowed to rise without obstacle. We can, of course, block the channels all over again and we do very effectively, hour by hour, if not minute by minute, with the preoccupation, the self-concern, and the fantasy that are natural to us, it seems. Nonetheless, the fact remains. Here, in this event, God's wanting to be here breaks through. And we know that there is a depth urgently pushing to break through, and that our task is to let it. And we know that when and as we let it, we are given the grace to be where Jesus is, next to the Father's heart. To those who received him, who trusted in his name, he gave authority to become children of God. Now that, I think, is the broadest theological picture we can feel our way towards in understanding the gift of Christmas. But it brings with it other kinds of gift, other kinds of insight. And I want to spend just a few minutes talking about some of those other dimensions or facets of this. Not least important is the recognition that if in myself there is this depth seeking to come through, so there is in you. The tight, the inseparable correlation between our practice in meditation and our approach to one another is grounded here. If God wants to be in me, God wants to be in you. And when I relate to any other human being, and indeed any other creature, what I'm relating to is a place where God wants to be more fully. And a creative, a constructive, or a just relationship to any other person or any other dimension of creation has to be a relation to that dimension of being. When I encounter another human being, annoying, obnoxious, baffling, hostile, what I have to bear in mind is that God wants to be there that God is pushing through whatever layers there are stifling the Logos, as God is pushing through those stifling layers in me. The word justice can so often have a rather mechanical feel to it. But it seems that the justice of God in Scripture is always something to do with our being aligned with 
that depth in another person, responding justly, that is, rightly, fairly, in a properly attuned way to what there is in the life of the other and what's coming to be in them. And if that sounds difficult, well, But equally, justice in respect to the world around us, the justice that God asks for us in relation to our whole environment, our material environment, has something of the same character. To relate to the world around us justly, accurately, and fairly is to relate to it as the place where God wants to be. Not a place littered with stuff that we can pick up and use as we please, but a place where constantly God is pushing up to meet us and is our desire as we encounter the world around going to meet God's pushing up, God's desire to be, or is it going to ignore it and seek to override it? So this recognition of the gift God coming to be among us in Jesus overflows in all directions. It overflows in our ethics, that useless word to describe how we grow up into God. It overflows into our relation with what we call our environment, speaking sometimes as if we weren't really part of it. But in all of this, logos echoes logos, word echoes word, presence echoes presence, pressure echoes pressure. And the life that God makes possible for us to live through the events of the humanity of Jesus, that is a life in which we justly hear and rightly respond to God's will, presence, action, and being all around. It also means, though, this is a point which perhaps hardly needs elaboration, that as we approach the other, and as we approach the world around, we are always to be open to what is being given. And one of the most significant spiritual questions there ever is in our relation to another human being or a situation in our world is that tough question, what is being given? What is to be received here? Which is not to say that every cloud has a silver lining or every story has a moral, just to say that even in the deepest and most difficult of situations, the pressure of God to be is there to be discerned and felt after and listened for. That's one cluster of implications of the gift of Christmas. There's perhaps another worth thinking about too. And that is this is a gift which is both obvious and strange. Once again, St. John's Gospel puts it very clearly. He came to his own and his own received him not. In other words, people who might be expected to recognize the gift when it's given have no idea what's going on. And lest you should think that that's St. John simply being anti-Semitic or something, it's worth remembering that St. John regards God's own as us in general. It's us he's talking about. He came to his own, those whom he's made, those in whom his life lives, and they do not know that that is the life they live. We say and we sing at this time of year that the newborn Christ is the desire of all nations, what everybody really wants. And then we think, so if that's what everybody really wants, 
exactly why is it that the desire of all nations was rejected and murdered, and is rejected and murdered by you and me in various forms day by day. The gift is familiar, the gift is strange, which is a way of telling us how strange we are to ourselves, how much energy we put into making ourselves strangers to ourselves, how much energy we pour into making ourselves less than human. When we think of the colossal imagination and ingenuity and the vast financial resource poured into this project, we have to feel a certain perverse admiration for ourselves as a human race. All the gifts that God has poured upon us in creation, we systematically use to prevent ourselves listening to God in creation. Ingenious, but not a very good plan for well-being here or in eternity. Part of the gift of Christmas is that difficult gift of knowing that we haven't yet become ourselves and that there's quite a struggle to learn how to be where we are and who we are. Now, don't mistake me. I'm not saying that somewhere inside me there is a nice, comfortable, glowing, pure, true self. And once I've cleared away all the rubbish, my true self will simply shine out. If only. It's much more that my true self, who I am before God, is precisely what comes into being, what comes into being as God comes alive in me, as I live in justice and in alignment. I shape and embody that truth as I struggle towards the justice of God, towards that openness to God's pressure to be in me. And the gift is not a vision of my pure, true self. It's the gift of a strength to be honest day after day in that struggle and not to despair. When St. Silwan of Mount Athos, the great Russian teacher of the early 20th century, said to his disciple, keep your soul in hell and do not despair, Perhaps that was part of what he meant. Keep your soul in hell. Don't forget how strange you are to yourself, because hell is the ultimate estrangement from truth and self. Keep your eyes on that, and don't give up. Don't despair, because however much of a mess you make of that, the gift is the assurance of promise the assurance that God's pressure to come alive is simply there and given. Welcome gifts, unwelcome gifts. The gift that is strange and disturbing and feels sometimes almost hostile to what we take for granted, and the gift that is what releases us to be who we are, that is most natural, most obvious. A real paradox. We fling around words like paradox very loosely, but for once, there's a real one. And that's because we are the way we are, at odds with ourselves so often. And if the good news is true, then the only way in which we begin to move a bit beyond that being at odds with ourselves is learning to trust but this life given to us, this pressure to be in us, doesn't go away. And that perhaps is one of the deepest levels of awareness of gift. The awareness of what we might call the faithfulness of God. The one who calls is faithful, says the New Testament. <clears throat> 
God doesn't simply summon us into an impossible set of demands. God consistently sticks with us in our growing. And the gift of Christmas has a lot to do with that sense of a faithful God, a committed God. The service of nine lessons and carols is not just a wonderful money spinner for another college in Cambridge. <laughs> it's also a real theological exercise. It reminds us that there is a pattern in the engagement of the eternal with the world. That from the start of the story, we have sought to resist the truth and the truth has refused to be put off or put away. So to speak of Jesus as the desire of all nations, as the fulfillment of prophecy, the one who is to come, is to say, yes, here we see as we look back a story whose natural progression leads to this point, this breakthrough the blossom coming through the soil. And we begin to understand that part of the pattern of God's dealing with us here and now, as in the history we relate at Christmas, is, as I hinted earlier, that at the times when it seems we can't make much sense or be aware of much movement, growth steadily continues. And the important thing is not to chart it or map it or make it an object, but to let it be. Because the one who calls is faithful. We don't have to persuade God not to go away. God in creation itself, never mind Christmas, God has committed God's self to what God has made. How could it not be so? The only way in which God could make is by sharing the life that he is in this diversified, even fractured form that we experience. And we, as we learn to grow in faith and love, grow in that life. The gift of Christmas is an inexhaustible subject to reflect on. And it does, as Father Lawrence indicated, give us a little bit of critical perspective on how we throw around words like gift, especially at this season. We can think of gift sometimes as what puts us under obligation. They've sent us something, what do we do? We can think of gift as something offered to placate for a purpose. If I give, they will feel better. And the gift of Christmas is not a gift that puts pressure on, but the gift that allows that pressure to be released and to swell and overflow. The gift that comes from the very depth of nature, God's nature, God's being itself. God does not seek to bribe, manipulate, or bully the world God has made. God does not give us a gift so that we will feel horribly obliged and worried. And God does not demand that we give God gifts that will make God feel better about us. <laughs> All of that language has to dissolve in the face of this fundamental fact of a sharing of life and being, a sharing of the agency and the pressure that I've spoken of. Because it's in that context that we can see how the body of Christ on earth works. <laughs>
a constant exchange of gift which is without pressure and manipulation, but where we are constantly living into and for the life of our neighbors, and they living into and for the life that is in us, the body of Christ on earth. Because it is worth remembering that the events of Christmas and the gift of Christmas are not simply to do with a life 2,000 years ago. I do occasionally get a bit impatient with those carols which go on and on about how long ago it all was, as if we'd nearly forgotten it and it happened in a kind of fairy tale world. Because the gift of Christmas is the gift of today. It's the gift of a life, a relationship, an intimacy given now. It's the gift of possibilities of relationship to others and to our world, given here and now. It's the gift of mutuality, mutual building up and nourishment that is the community here and now. Not long, long ago and far, far away. God's gift in Jesus at Christmas is not the gift of a pity story, an inspiring example, not the gift which is meant to make us feel even worse than we do already. It's the gift that releases because it shares, that releases us from the clutter of selfishness and sin, that unblocks the channels that lets the water rise. That's what we give thanks for at this season. That's what we seek to open ourselves to in the silence, the somewhat uh, beleaguered silence these days of Advent. And that is what gives us the hope that we in turn want to give. Because in conclusion, we might ask, how does the gift of Christmas become the gift we have to share with the world? The answer can only be, it becomes that if we are seriously struggling to open ourselves to the pressure of God to be in our lives. Because that is what transfigures, opens up, transforms our relationship with the people around us, the world around us. What we have to give is the echo, the image, more than that, the sharing in a divine life which tells us that we can be who we really are, that we do not have to be stifled or to stifle ourselves, that we do not have to live in a world of manipulation, rivalry, and bullying. That there is a life which enlightens everyone coming into the world. And that life is in the gift given us. Not just at the first Christmas. Not just every 25th of December. But given us whenever we turn to the mystery of Christ in silence and in thanksgiving. I'm going to uh, just ask you a few, uh, or pursue a few uh, of, your, of your thoughts and insights, and then uh, invite um, invite all of us here to, uh, to raise any questions, uh, try to keep them brief and, and clear, but to raise any questions or, that you'd like to, to, to raise. Um, you, you gave this uh, wonderful image, this great metaphor of, of, the, of the birth, the incarnation, as a kind of pressure building up from the from below 
uh, the visible world or, uh, and seeking to, to break through uh, into all aspects of creation, not only the human, uh, but everything that came to be is subject to this will of God, as you said, to, uh, to bring it into the fullness of being. And the human, as far as we can see in the universe, um, represents the, that fullest expression of divine being. And therefore, perhaps that is why God became human. So, I, the first thing I wanted to, to ask you was this question of metaphor. We have to use these kinds of metaphors, you, you took the metaphor of the will of God and then you said, well, that's, you know, God doesn't will in the way that we will things and God doesn't get angry and God doesn't uh, get sad about the things we get angry and sad about. So uh, we have to use these metaphors and uh, we have to let them go uh, as well and realize that we use them in, in when we speak about God in these terms, we're using these words and metaphors in, different, in a different way from when we're using them about ourselves. But where does the metaphor stop? How far, how far can we go? Uh, and at what point can we really be free from all metaphor and be in the reality of it. And if we are in that reality, I think uh, we, we find this idea many times in the, in the Orthodox uh, Fathers, at, at what, if we are in that reality, can we speak about it? Can we express it? How do we communicate it without turning it, you know, again into another metaphor? Can, because cr Christmas is so easily caught up in in the mythology, in the myths, in the, uh, the cultural metaphors. How do we get out of that metaphor, or do you think we can? Well, first of all, I, I don't think metaphor is, is a bad thing. Um, there are some things about which literally we can only speak in metaphors. We can't trim them down to simple and apparently literal language. Somebody pointed out that the words literal and metaphorical both carry metaphors in them. Mm. Literal is about letters. Mm. Metaphorical, from the Greek, carrying one thing from one place to another. We can't unscramble the metaphorical, and we shouldn't be afraid of it, so long as we know that what we're doing is, so to speak, stumbling along um, a few million miles behind the reality we're speaking of. And I, I may be simple-minded about this, but I, I feel that to say we speak of God in metaphors is not something we should somehow be ashamed of, as if there were a better way. It doesn't mean we speak inaccurately or untruthfully about God. It means we tell what truth we can about God, and this is how we tell it. So, when we speak of God wanting, willing, when we speak of God having mercy or forgiving, when we speak of God judging or even intervening, all of this is language we ought to be very aware of as inadequate, but it tells us something of what we need to know that the God we are relating to is a God we relate to as we would to someone who was showing mercy, who was intervening, who was forgiving. Now, beyond that, and it's all really at the beginning of St. Thomas Aquinas's um, mm. of Theologia, mm. it's a metaphor in theology. Beyond that is the the recognition that, as the Anglican theologian Richard Hooker said, 
our safest eloquence is silence. Which doesn't mean, I think, that we simply say we can't say anything about God. It means that any language worth its salt about God is going to bring us to a point where we say, right, that's as much as I can realistically say. St. Augustine says in one of his sermons on the Psalms, before you encounter God, you think it's something you can talk about. And when you do, you know it isn't. Mm. If you can understand it, it isn't God. Yes. So, um, so why do religious people uh, spend so much time in metaphor, uh, which, as you say, has an important role, and so little time in silence? Well, Why silence is there that is, tendency, that tendency yes. to, to... Silence is, is labor, because it's not just absence. It's, in one sense, it's the, the most intense activity hmm. that we can ever engage in, because it's the activity by which we seek to align ourselves with the endless act of God. And so all our passive, reactive, self protective, instinctual, um, panicky mechanisms get in the way, and it can be a lot easier to go on mattering about metaphor. The other side of it, of course, is that there's a proper exuberance to theological language, and I guess that's one of the things people value at Christmas. We can be exuberant mm. a bit, and when I bellow at that impossibly high pitch, veiled in flesh, the Godhead, see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with man to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. Um, I don't feel any bad conscience about it, I must say. Partly because that is an example of the words that push you to a point where you say, well, you know, if that's true, I don't know what to say about it. <laughs> the other, um, you, you quoted uh, St. John that we, we, are, we have the authority to be children of God, that we're given this option and so on. But actually the fathers uh, went even further, didn't they? They said God became human so that human beings might become God. We don't hear that preached on very often. Why is that, do you think? We've got very jumpy about pantheism, about the idea we're absorbed into God. We have all sorts of bizarre pictures, I think, of what that might mean. And yet there it is in the New Testament. Um, Jesus himself, again, in St. John's Gospel, says to his opponents at one point that in the Psalms, you, you have the phrase, you are gods, children mm. of the Most High. So, says Jesus, if the Spirit can use the word gods of those to whom the word of God came, so, the thing is, I think, to try to be reasonably clear about what it does and doesn't mean, to say we become God doesn't mean that each one of us turns into the creator of the universe, um, what you might call the Bruce Almighty scenario, <laughs> which is a typical bit of witless mm. theological illiteracy, <laughs> and one, one which most of us are guilty of a lot of the time, because we'd all rather like to be the maker of the Universe, because then we could organize things as we pleased. No, becoming God, in this sense, is being, as I said earlier, attuned to the life of God, being animated by the life of God, being delivered from the barriers that we set up between our life and God's life. And above all, in Christian terms, it means being in Jesus mm. and being able with Jesus to say Abba to the mystery of the source. Mm. Now, all of that which runs right through the fourth gospel, right through St. Paul's epistles as well, all of that is what it means that we become divine. It doesn't mean that we acquire the attributes of God, you know, infinity and timelessness and all the rest of it, it does mean we acquire the relation and the character of God, the relation to God as Abba, the character of God as 
limitlessly generous, and that's what we enter into. That's, mm. that's the air we breathe. Mm. So, and Jesus, when he returned to the Father, could only do that after and through his death. And we also, before we can become God, although the process, uh, I'll come back to that in a minute, but the process that uh, happens now in this life from the moment of conception and through our stages of development and so on, but we also have to go through death before that is fully realized. Is there any way that we can or should we even try to imagine what actually dies and disappears for good and all in our personality, in our ego, in our sense of self, and what is, what uh, survives or what uh, becomes God, and that we can at the same time call, the questions get easier after this actually. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> there isn't much we can say about it, and so maybe yeah, that's yeah, maybe not yeah, much has been said about it. That's about right, I think. Okay. Um, because I don't think we're talking about bits of ourselves, nice bits and nasty bits, um, bits that could be discarded and bits that will last, any more than the promise of eternal life is the promise that there's a bit of us that goes on and a bit of us that stops. We're talking rather about what the practice is that, that takes us deeper. And I, I'm inclined to say that's, that's almost all we can say. We can talk about the practice that checks our selfish fantasy, the practice that reigns in our fear and our evasiveness, the practice that, hmm, if you want spatial language, it dismantles the sort of clutter. Mm. But I'm wary of suggesting that, you know, that there are different bits that mm. um, somehow you can spatialize or materialize the self, the soul in that way. It's, it's all about, I think, the, the process we enter, and the mm. practice we enter. And... Um, so you, you, you can, you think very deeply about these issues as a theologian, as a teacher. Um, you told me several times that you'd gone into schools and discovered that the schools had been already introduced to meditation and the children uh, wanted to meditate with you and you meditated with them. What did that experience teach you what do you think it can teach all of us, really, about, the, uh, about this theology and how this theology uh, can be understood and uh, communicated and developed uh, in, in our time? Do, do, do you see a, a meaning in that? Yes, I do. I don't want to be sentimental or unrealistic about um, children, whether meditating or not, mm. but, and it's a big but, when I sit with children, meditating, or indeed in other circumstances sometimes, and I'm thinking here of one particular church school in Manchester that I've had dealings with for the last 12 years, and visited regularly, and they do the most extraordinary art, music, and drama, and it's one of those places where I've seen the Christian faith come alive as almost nowhere else. I think, once again, You've got to put an awful lot of work and ingenuity into ruining that. <laughs> and we do. <laughs> you know, we, we nurture our young people, our small children, often quite well. We see them often generously and imaginatively through the first stages of their education. And it's then as if we say, all right, that's enough of that. Now we've got to get you used to the real world. And so we block their access to the real world and introduce them to this bizarre, feverish, virtual reality that we call the real world <laughs> and that most of us move in so much of the time. And I think <laughs> that's one thing to learn. It does take a lot of effort to, to stifle 
what sometimes seems the instinctive attunement, to use that word again, of human beings to stillness and love and truth. And I don't believe that you know, children are somehow words worthy in angels, but there is something about the receptivity of childhood that we do our best to squash and distort mm -hmm. in all sorts of ways. It's strange that well, both as a, as a spiritual teacher and disciple and, and, as, a, and as a parent, what, what would you say, um, it often strikes me, I was talking to uh, some doctors the other day and they, they all wanted, they started a course we're giving um, at the College of Physicians in Ireland on, uh, on meditation. And they all want to learn to meditate. They're not interested so much in the scientific evidence, but they want, they understand and they want uh, intuitively to, to meditate. And they came back a month later and most of them hadn't been able to do it wanted to do it and they couldn't do it. And yet when, uh, in, with children, we find that uh, the children, with a little bit of help at the, in the early stages, will get into it, will ask for it in the, in the classroom. As they move into the next year, uh, they will say, you know, why can't we meditate, miss? Uh, and yet, we don't tell them, you know, you have to see this as a great discipline and as a great work and as a great struggle to over, you know. But most of them will say in conversation, or if you ask them, that they, they choose to meditate at other times of the day, uh, especially when they feel hurt or angry or upset. They have this, this simple, intuitive... Uh, uh, deduction that if they go into this time of silence, they will reconnect to, to, their, to their peaceful center. What does that tell us about how we should teach prayer? If I'm allowed another Augustinian reference, Augustine in the Confessions talks about our having a home in God, which does not fall down simply because we're away. And the good news, I think, when we speak about meditation, is that there is a home for us. There is a where we belong. And the metaphors again come thick and fast, but I guess that what the child asking about meditation is aware of is very like the child's sense that there is a home, literally. Mm. There's, there is a place to be where we belong. The gospel is, in part, but that place is the place that Jesus defines and opens up for us. And if it's simply about, you know, if it's law, not gospel, if it's, well, you know, you've got to work mm. pretty damn hard about this, mm. rather than there is a place then maybe we get the balance wrong. I, I know I talked quite a bit about struggle, and I guess that illustrates my problems with it. <laughs> but I think the, the good news is, like um, you know, West Side Story, there's a place for us. <laughs> <laughs> you, you were talking about how we, we very ingeniously uh, block, block that uh, pressure of God's wanting to be fully alive in us and turning us into the divine in some way. Uh, and we av avoid it and we run away from it and we, we, we create all sorts of delusions, fantasies and addictions to um, or power systems, uh, including religious ones, to, uh, to, to block it. And uh, then you, you spoke also about the hope that the gift of Christmas uh, gives us and how we are challenged and invited to share that hope with others. Mm 
very difficult to do, you know, when uh, in, a, in a culture like ours, where there is so much investment outside of that zone of hope, you know, where people are, uh, are, are really uh, dis distracted, where they are really alienated from the symbols uh, and the, the language and the, the sort of language we're using now, yes. which most of us can accept without having to unpack too much. We can use these, these terms, uh, you know, uh, confidently. But so thinking of that consumerism on the one hand, which is a real blocking of the spirit, I think. And on the other hand, you know, that tragedy in, in Pakistan a few days ago, that just nightmare in humanity, the killing of the massacre of the innocents there. So what does it really mean? And how can we really share this gift of hope that has touched and blessed our lives and given us a way to, to deal with the problems and difficulties of our own personalities and our own uh, circumstances. So, so how do we and can we really, how can we really share that hope with, with people, with, with a society in which those things can happen, Pakistan or, or the Heathrow Airport uh, uh, shopping mall. You know? How does hope, how do we, how do we uh, communicate hope or share hope? Two things, perhaps, to think about there. One is, let's stay with the language of place for a moment. I think the person who is seeking in some way to be aligned to God, with God, can become a place for others. That is, can be making space for the confusion, the grief, the anxiety, or whatever of others. That's, again, easier said than either done or understood. And yet, what comes closest, I think, to making sense of faith for people in our world is the awareness or the confidence that there is somewhere for their deepest sensations and struggles and anxieties to go. Mm. And we, as people of faith, can try to be as well, part of that place, that where to go. And the second thing to say is the obvious one, that hope is not optimism or evasion. To say that there is hope in a situation is not to say it's not as bad as you thought. It may be to say it's every bit as bad as you thought, and that is not the whole story. Or that is not, that does not destroy what is there in the depths of being. So, faced with the horror of Bashar, and God forbid we should ever say anything that sounded like, it's not as bad as it looks. Of course it's as bad as it looks. In a sense you could say it's worse than it looks because it's, mm. it's such a, a monstrous insult to the human spirit as well as the divine creator. It's not just, just the butchery of innocent individuals. It's a, a hideous blasphemy against who we are and what we are as humans. That's why it hurts so deeply to see these images. No, it's, it's, it's every bit as bad. And the, the very fact that we feel it so deeply as evil is a kind of testimony to the fact that we know there is something about human beings hmm. which makes this not just an unhappy accident or a sad crime but a real outrage. Isn't that what the, the Christmas story is about? As we'll talk about this tomorrow more, but you know, the, the, just the, the, there's so many elements in the Christmas story that we sentimentalize and you know we we, we um, misinterpret or gloss over. Uh, 
of 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 pain and of um, you know social exclusion and the holy family becoming a, a refugee family and then and then the massacre of the innocents itself i mean these are very these aren't it's not a nice story really is it being born you know and first of all he's born uh, he, you know, he's just about to be declared a bastard you know which would have meant a complete uh, exclusion of his mother and his, so he would have just on the knife edge of respectability really and and then all those other elements his exclusion no room at the inn why 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 how do we turn that story into such a a pretty little story as you were saying yes. because actually it's much it's rather closer to Peshawar than than we thought yes, yes. i was preaching a few days ago um, on this and expressed my bewilderment at the carol, O little town of Bethlehem, how still we see thee lie. I don't think it was any stiller then than it is today. And, you know, some of the, the awful challenges and um, sufferings, those women who, for several years, um, had to give birth at checkpoints because of mm. the inadequacies of the system. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the kind of world we're talking about. We're talking about someone in the last stages of pregnancy in a hideously overcrowded, violent environment. We know from the historians that the census was the occasion of major terrorist activity, as we now call it. Mm. We know that Bethlehem is a, is a flashpoint, then as now. Mm. And that's the world into which God comes. And God doesn't deal with a sanitized and tidied up version of the human world, but with the human world as it is, just as God doesn't deal with a sanitized and tidied up version of you and me, but with you and me as we are. Hmm. Well, thank you. I think uh, we should now uh, open up the conversation and questions. Um, I don't know if we, do we have a mic? We can. We have a mic coming. So there's that, somebody in the front row here, and somebody over there. Can I just ask you to to um, to keep your questions as concise as Rowan's uh, sentences? Okay, thank you. That's a first. <laughs> I'm a Quaker, and so I've really appreciated your words on silence. What fascinated me was your use of, of the term pressure, God's pressure, which Simon Weil, uh, Simon Weil, makes great play of once you talk to Bart Perry in, in Marseille. And the other thing was the use of the idea of a well inside us, which was a, a well inside us, well. Which, in which uh, uh, there is a pressure rising. And I think uh, that's something that Hetty Hilson, the um, Dutch Jewess, also talks about in her famous diary. And uh, she says that we have to dig out the rubbish that we throw into this well. And uh, I'm now thinking of the God's pressure as being an artesian well, so okay. it's forcing up, so the more we dig, the more the pressure comes towards us, which is a wonderful idea, I think. So, what I wanted to ask you, though, was this. I recently wrote an article in the Quaker magazine in which I argued that the intellect cannot say anything about God. Now, you've said several things about God, for instance, God's mercy, God's commitment to us. What I argued was that the intellect can't say anything about God, but what it can do is to say things about the impact of God's pressure upon us, rather than say anything. Now, if you take that view, that you can't say anything about God. Okay, let's, let's ask Bishop Rowan to respond to that. Thank you very much. I'm really very, very glad indeed that you found the echoes with 
two of my favorite writers, Simon Weil and Eddie Hillison. Um, Eddie Hillison, for me, becomes more and more important as I think about her and read. Mm -hmm. As somebody who, as a word, discovers what God means in the most appalling circumstances, the Nazi occupation of Amsterdam, her own journey to Auschwitz, and simply grows into it in the most amazing and not at all pietistic way. But your question, um, what can we say about God? I think what you're doing there actually is paraphrasing what um, many Eastern Orthodox would say. We can't talk about the essence of God. We absolutely can't talk about what it's like to be God. We talk about the energies of God, that is the actions of God as they impress upon us. And that seems to me a very reasonable, reasonable, you know, <laughs> ac adequate way of looking at it. Because if we could talk about the essence of God, we would be able to walk around God, so to speak, and say, well, God starts here and stops there. And we can't do that. But we can make some truthful statements about how God impacts upon us. Thank you. There is a question from the back there somewhere? Yeah. Uh, yes, could I, could I ask you, do you think it was an accident that Christ was um, born poor, stayed poor, uh, res resisted rich patrons, uh, died poor, and recruited poor men? Was that an accident? Certainly not. Um, I think when St. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that Christ was rich and for your sake made himself poor, he meant both that the infinite abundance of God is, if you like, stripped down to the simplicity of a human life, and that that human life is stripped down to the simplicity of poverty and suffering as well because that Jesus' life is such an undefended life has to be a central part of what all this is about. If Jesus were presented to us in the Gospels as somebody um, anxious about his career prospects, saving up for his retirement, you know, that, that wouldn't quite be <laughs> the good news, I think. So, no, I don't think it's an accident at all. There's somebody over there, I think. So, um, I have a question. Very often, uh, like you said, we think about incarnation, and rightly so, as a divine intervention, intervention that started at Annunciation, and it's most vividly described in St. Luke's Gospel. But I often think about beginning of St. Matthew Gospel, the Christ genealogy. Um, I recently read a book by famous uh, Russian theologian Sergius Bulgakov called Holy Grail, in, in which he said something very challenging uh, for me as a Christian, although he is Christian himself. He says that there is an aspect uh, of Christ in, in, in Christ's incarnation that we as a human race, we are worse off after the ascension than people who lived before Christ was uh, incarnated. Because of the genealogy, we can look at the Christ family tree and we can see, like you said, that there, is, there are people there, there are real people, and the beginning of Christ's life on earth is the flowering of something that was going into the past for a very long time, his ancestry. So, after Christ's ascension, we could see this as an abandonment. In a way, he's even using the word the incarnation, although that is a very strong word. But there is a sense that that continuity that was, that was there at the beginning of St. Matthew Gospel is suddenly lost. Hmm. And, of course, he's a, he's a Russian Orthodox priest. He, he didn't overlook the fact that we receive Holy Eucharist every Sunday, but there is something there that is very, uh, that, 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 is, that is missing in our lives. 
Thank you. Can you join us? Thank you. Um, that's a very interesting one. <clears throat> um, for those who didn't pick it all up, perhaps, um, the reference was to the idea of the Russian theologian Sergei Bulgakov that um, St. Matthew's Gospel gives us in the genealogy of Christ at the beginning a model of continuity coming to fruition, but it's as if when the ascension takes place, that continuity is sort of broken. There's a de-incarnation. It's, it's an odd perspective, which I, I do find a bit surprising in some ways. Um, it seems to me there are two different kinds of story going on here. There's a sense in which when the breakthrough takes place in the person of Christ, one story has come to an end, come to its climax. The, the drama of waiting and preparation of trial and error, the, the line of very, very uneven real people who lead up to the birth of Christ, that's come to its natural dramatic term. And another kind of story begins in which there isn't, if you like, a natural progression from then to the end of the world, but it's much more that Christ keeps on returning to the Father in life after life after life. We learn from those lives, we build on what's gone before, but there isn't the same kind of straightforward narrative to be told. But the continuities are still there, as you say, in the sacramental life of the church and the lives of the saints. So I'd need a bit of time to disentangle all that, but that's a, a brief response to, to the idea. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, John? You mentioned that ethics was a useless word. <laughs> I use in my work the word values. I don't think it's a useless word. You'd be pleased to say I'm not going to tell you why, but I was going to ask you why you thought ethics was a useless word. <laughs> oh. Well, for every idle word a man speaks will be counted at the Day of Judgment. Um, Yes, I was being mischievous, I'm afraid. Um, it's just that sometimes people talk about ethics as if it were something independent of the vision we have of reality as a whole, of grace and holiness and, and God. And you know, then there's something called ethics. Whereas I want to roll up ethics into theology a bit more and say that ethics, insofar as it really matters and is solid, is about quite simply, what a life well lived in the body of Christ is like, and how that enlightens or enlivens the world of human striving and human judgment and discernment. So don't take me too literally about the uselessness of ethics. I'm quite prepared to rehabilitate it. I just want to, to challenge the way in which sometimes it, it floats free of these framing visions. So forgive me for being... <laughs> Flippant about it. You, 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 you've spoken, uh, written about Sarah Bachelor's book, recent book. Uh, I, I saw her recently in Australia. She's a member of our community in Australia who is a very interesting and uh, <clears throat> thoughtful theologian of the future, I think. And she, she's written a, a book about the relationship between moral or morality, moral theology, and the resurrection. Would you like to say a brief word about that? Um, well, yes, I'm very, always very happy to give commercials for Sarah's <laughs> writing because it really is first class. I think what, sh what she's after is um, underlining the fact that the resurrection of Jesus, again, is not an event that happened a long time ago. It is the act that constitutes us here and now in certain kinds of relationship to one another, which allows us to to cope with the complexity and imperfection of our relations because something runs through and holds together. But that, that's a ludicrously thin account of a very, very rich book which makes full use of philosophy and fiction and drama as well as theology. Um, I, I declare an interest. Sarah was a pupil of mine and happily, like many pupils of mine, she's gone on to be a much better theologian than a teacher. So do read her.
is, uh, where are we now? Somebody over there. Yeah. The front. Oh, yes. <coughs> You've given us this wonderful image of the pressure, God being a pressure. Um, does that image imply also that God is not a static being, but rather God is becoming? Sorry, could you just say that last bit again? Yeah. Does the image of the pressure welling up in us implies also something about the nature of God, that God is not a static being, but rather God is becoming, almost in an evolutionary sense? Thank you. I, to be honest, I'm very cautious about the language of God as becoming in an evolutionary sense, because God is God. Is God. Um, I don't think one can have any theology or practice without the conviction that what we're dealing with is the unconditioned, the unconditioned. But of course, within creation, that presence is always becoming in us, in creatures. It's not a static thing. It's not a static thing in eternity either. It's an intensely active thing. But in this world, it's not static. It is moving at different levels in different ways, I think. My reluctance to talk about God becoming is that I can't really myself make much sense of the idea that creation changes God. Or rather, as um, the classical theologians say, creation doesn't change God as God but back to the earlier question, changes the relation we have with God, changes what can be said about God at this point or that point. So, walking a bit of a tightrope there. If, if we can't, um, if we say that the, the birth of Jesus, if we see that as the incarnation, the word made flesh, if we don't say that that is in some way linked to human evolution, and the Ancient theologians used to say this, this was the, the center point of human history. So if we, we can't say that it's linked to evolution, it must be random. Oh, I, I distinguish. Um, I think that's perfectly right, that we can talk about the birth of Jesus as having its place within the process mm. by which God's work works itself out in creation. Mm. That, I think, is different from saying, God evolves, mm. which I mm. have qualms about, mm. real qualms. So can we say why he was born in Bethlehem in the year uh, whatever it was? Is, is, is there an evolutionary, could there be, a, would there be one day a, a theological, a, a, a study of the, theological evolution that would make sense of that in the same way as we make sense of you know, other aspects of, of, uh, of the cosmological story? Well, level one, back to what we were saying earlier about um, the narrative. Yes, there's a progression whereby you can say, as people have often said, that the destiny and vocation of God's people in fact, narrows down <laughs> instead of mm. the remnant mm. to the remnant that is Mary, saying yes. Mm. And Yes, you can see the narrative logic of that. Did it have to happen then? What if Mary had said no? Would there have been another opportunity? Well, you know, I don't know and I don't want to know. <laughs> um, because <laughs> at another level, I, I'm not quite sure why we'd want to know. Very much like Julian and Norwich. <laughs> uh, we, know, we know what we need to know and not, not more. Suspect, yeah. yes. Okay, is there, there was another question. Oh, somebody in the front, sorry. Yes. pick up on what you were saying about metaphor. I've always been very grateful for what you said about metaphor. Oh, yes. That, that we needn't be afraid of metaphor. That there doesn't have to be anything beyond metaphor. The reality is in... Reality is a metaphor. And I'm thinking of the danger of going perhaps I think the safest eloquence is silence, you quoted. The danger of 
believing that God is in man and therefore we chop off other men's heads to prove that our God is right. So once you go on the other side, the danger of fundamentalism is being out of all metaphor. And I think that's horrifying and terrifying. Thank you. I think that, that's exactly to the point. Um, the problem with fundamentalism is, I think, both a problem about language and a problem about relation. A problem about language in that it suggests we could, in principle, have the kind of exact knowledge of God we have of any object in the universe. But that instantly tells you there's a problem about relation, because that's not how we relate to God. God is not the object at arm's length, not under a microscope at the end of a telescope. That is not what scripture and theology tell us about God. The God who is, in Augustine's words, more intimate to me than I am to myself is not a God I can sort of project out there and just, as I say, walk around. So fundamentalism, I think, is a two-fold mistake about the kind of object we're talking about, i.e. we're not talking about an object with God, a thing out there, but that which encompasses everything and is in and through all. And then it's the mistake about relationship. It's suggesting there's an arm's length way of talking about God, nailing down what we know. So, you yeah, know, real problem. Uh, sorry, we've got one there. Yeah. Uh, here first, and then this gentleman. You said that God doesn't bully us, so I just wondered how you would um, square that with the God of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. I think, thank you, uh, God doesn't bully us, so what about the God of the Old Testament? Well, I think if you, if you were to read the Old Testament as um, a neat description of how God goes about God's business, then you'd want to say, as um, many readers have said from time to time, that God is not a very pleasant character in some episodes. But back to the answer to the last question. Is that how the language is meant to be read? I, since the first generations of Christians, not to mention the Jews of that same era, in fact, that's not how it's been read. We constantly read scripture in a more primitive way than it was meant to be read. And we read scripture sometimes with less intelligence than people in the second and third century of the Christian era read it. They would say, well, you know, here are, if you like, parabolic stories in which God is represented as being angry, as being um, moved to this, as changing his mind and all the rest of it, and sometimes as being pretty uh, in your face about what he wants. And they said, well, you know, all of these are stories designed like the parables of Jesus to bring us to a point where we realize something. They're not meant to be you know, point by point photographic descriptions. They're meant to generate in us a recognition, a change. So um, it's how we read the, the texts, I think. And this is not just some kind of modernizing fantasy. This is what people were saying. It's what somebody like Jesus' contemporary, Philo of Alexandria, was saying about the first five books of, of the Hebrew Scriptures when he says, oh, of course, you know, God doesn't go for evening walks in a garden. But what does, that, what does that story mean us to hear and to learn? That's where the work starts. That's where the interesting stuff starts. Could we just take one, one more? Um, Bishop Williams, a very simple and um, perhaps rather direct question. Could you say something about your own practice as a meditator? Um, I could try. Um, first of all, it's, um, it's a pretty inadequate practice, um, goes without saying, but for, I suppose, really as far, almost as far back as I can remember since reading Archbishop Anthony Bloom as a teenager, 
the Eastern Christian tradition has shaped the way I approach my meditation. So the Jesus prayer, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner, has been, since I was 20 odd, the, the backbone of my prayer. And to say that at least 100 times a day has been, I suppose, what I've taken for granted as the backdrop since, since early adulthood. And that's why I, I carry with me always a chalvaskinion uh, to, uh, to dip into and out of at other times. Um, but in practice, that means a morning sitting with a hundred repetitions of the Jesus Prayer to settle, um, saying the prayer on the out-breath um, and pausing for, say, three heartbeats in between the repetitions. And that's a matter, I suppose, of up to 45 minutes in the morning, sometimes frequently rather less. And on busy days, I find myself trying to do it on the train or something, which is not always a brilliant idea, but you know, you have to try. <laughs> um, and just recognizing as people do after a while, you, the, the, the prayer, as the books say, starts up at odd moments. And sometimes if you're aware, if I'm aware that I'm going into some sort of fugue of um, anxiety or fantasy or whatever, just to say, okay, now it's time to let the prayer come and to, to do that. And, um, that's you know, in addition to practices, regular practices of the morning and evening office and so on, but that's, that's the center of it really. And um, there are things around that and practices around that and physical, physical practices to settle and assist and develop it, but that's the core of it. Thank you. Well, let's, um, could, I, could I ask you to, uh, now that we've reached the core, uh, could you lead us uh, just for five minutes or so into uh, a, short, uh, a short time of silent prayer and then end it with uh, with a, a blessing or a, or a prayer. You can do it from here if you like, or if you want to, you want to use the bell. Hmm? If, uh, if people can settle themselves as and where they'd like to be. In this period of quiet, as we breathe into the depth where God is rising, we open ourselves to the God who is always coming and becoming in us. And we greet the infinite, the unconditioned, with joy. <laughs> 